Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. In fact, I wouldn't be here if there weren't a Grassroot Institute because that's where I have the privilege of working. A few years ago, I met a remarkable individual, someone who stood for the values of individual liberty, the promotion of the free markets, limited and accountable government. Not only does he educate people in these areas, he stands for preserving these important values. What we care about greatly here in the United States of America would be lost were it not for education in these values and the promotion and protection of them. I'm talking about a gentleman whom I've come to respect deeply, and I'm grateful that I can consider him a mentor and a friend. He's the founder and chairman of the board of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, which many of you know is a public policy think tank where we do research and we also educate and try to influence policymakers for the good of society. It's also today, March 16th, 2015, and so I thought we'd do something. We'd meet this gentleman and wish him a happy 85th birthday. Please welcome to the program today, Richard O. Rowland. Dick, aloha to you. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. <laughs> glad to be here. 85 and going strong. <laughs> yes, it's it. Every day, I'm glad to be here. And I want to greet you with your traditional greeting to people, upward. Upward. And you're still traveling upward and we'll keep going. Well, thank you so much for all you've done for Hawaii and for our nation and for people across the world and articulating what it is to have individual liberty and promoting it and, and establishing the Grassroot Institute. Let me ask you what your source of inspiration is. You often refer to the Declaration of Independence. Is that your source of inspiration? That's the source. Inspiration? That's the source. And the reason for that is that the Declaration of Independence is not amendable. It's not, uh, you can't change it. It's, it gives us some immutable values that never change. Now that's interesting to, to say that it's not amendable because we often think of the Constitution as constantly amendable. That's why we have the amendments to the Constitution which sets up the laws we live by. But you treat the Declaration of Independence a little bit differently. How so? The, uh, the Declaration is, gives the purpose, mm -hmm. it gives the vision, for the United States of America, but also it was, it was overpoweringly important in the entire world because it, it expressed these values for the first time in an official document. What are some of those values in the Declaration of Independence? Well, the first so value is, is that the individual is supreme that the individual is important, the government's not important, the individual is important, and the individual forms government. Government does not form the individual. In other words, it's not about a king, it's not about a state. It's, what we really That's need right. to do is preserve the freedoms of the, the individual. Well, I guess, yeah, and while quickly, when we say that, we don't want, the Declaration of Independence makes it clear that there's a superior power and they're very careful not to phrase that in any in any sense like a religion sounding like a religion mm -hmm. but they make sure that they're talking about God they they have several other terms uh, higher power and this kind of thing but the whole idea is that no human being fallible as we are should ever be in absolute power. Lord Acton later said after the Declaration, a power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. He was talking about human uh, frailty. And that's why you've just pointed out that government isn't an end of in itself, that there's a higher power to which government is accountable. Why was this so important for the framers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to talk about. Uh, to talk to, about the higher that, power. Yes, that there's a power so above they, government. So that we never got into a position so that we had like a king saying, I've got absolute power, I can do anything I want because I'm divine. Uh, they took the position, there's a divine, some sort of divine power, but it's not human, it's spiritual. 
there's a spiritual power that controls the universe. Well, you know, that's a very interesting point of view because in your career, uh, you've not necessarily always been or been a religious man no. in, in terms of that's where right. you come from. Uh, you, you've been actively involved in the civic sector, the, the public sector. Yeah, yeah. Um, how can people who don't necessarily embrace religion benefit from the, this, this concept of the Founding Fathers that there's a higher power to which government must be accountable? Is that something that's just religious, or is that something that that benefits everybody? Well, uh, it benefits everybody, but I, my own personal opinion, yes. I think religion plays a very critical issue in society. And, and um, I guess one of the points in the Declaration of Independence is uh, if you read between the lines, they're essentially saying that society trumps government. In other words, the, if you took a, a, a pecking order and you said the individual is supreme, the individual lives in communities, well, families, communities, societies, and then a government is formed, or a government is a, a formed somewhere along these lines. But the 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 sequence of power, individual, family, um, community, government. Well, that's very interesting because it, it puts government at the very bottom when a lot of times we tend to think of government as, as the highest authority that's on right. top of everything, above society, above ultimately the, the individual. And So the Declaration makes clear that if a government does not serve the individual, the community, etc. Then it is it is the people are empowered to change the government. Now you've often been critical of government growing larger and more powerful at That's the expense right. of the 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 individual. That's right. For the last hundred years, we've had a growing government. It's gotten big, it doesn't matter what administration, doesn't matter what, for over 100 years we've had a, an increasing uh, slice of productivity of people taken away. And in the process, every individual in the United States, except for those that are on the government, uh, it, it, w have some kind of a government uh, advantage given by government. Uh, have suffered and gotten smaller. Mm. So the average citizen has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. So I say the bigger government gets, the smaller you get. But uh, the bigger government gets, smaller you get. But that's a negative. And so maybe it's better to turn that positive and say the bigger you get, the smaller the government can be. So the more... And the smaller the government will get if if many many of us get more and more powerful the government will shrink well i like that because that talks about empowering the individual that's right uh, the individual taking responsibility for himself or herself to be empowered and do you think a lot of times we neglect that and in neglecting our own empowerment we just let government grow and grow and grow you know i go to church and i listen and I think um, that's the whole Judeo-Christian base is that individuals are supposed to be individuals making individual choices free to make mistakes and correct them, but, but free to become better people, better and so forth. And, I go to church, and I don't hear enough of that. Mm. They, uh, uh, they, they aren't talking about that, uh, that importance of the individual being. They instead say things like, uh, uh, we honor our elected officials. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, the reverse uh, should be true. The elected officials should be honoring us sincerely. 
instead of insincerely. Mm, that's something. You, you speak quite a bit about individual liberty. Uh, and yet there are people today who, who take liberty and freedom and, and say it means being able to do anything I want to do anywhere, regardless of the consequences and, and so forth. Is that what you're talking about, that kind of freedom? Or, or uh, is your idea of individual liberty different? Uh, uh, you're talking about rules. Uh, you're talking about uh, structure. Um, and uh, I'm, in, I'm in favor of rules, but I'm in favor of rules that people, that people make in society, that the society develop rules. And so uh, uh, red, red lights and green lights in traffic are something that maybe government came up with that to start with, but the point is it's been embedded in society and tried to drive to town uh, in, in a in a, a metropolitan area without those signals, right. and you find that a 20-minute trip takes you an hour and 20, 20 minutes or something. So rules are terribly important, uh, but they shouldn't be rules that are what the government wants, but what is convenient to the people. It's like a business can't run a business, and they say we sell widgets, and we don't give a damn if the widgets are helpful to people or not, we just want them to buy them. Uh, well, no, well, that, that doesn't work. You know, that's uh, being in business is a win-win uh, combination. Uh, you, you want to sell something uh, or a service and somebody else comes along and wants to buy it. So you both won. Uh, and it's much different than the government saying, well, we need more money to run the government, so we're gonna impose a tax on you uh, that's not win-win, that's win-lose. So individual liberty doesn't mean not having rules and not being responsible. Lots of rules. Quite the, quite you, the opposite. Yeah, you, but when it comes to the rules and regulations we have in society, they need to make sense. They, they can't just be imposed because government wants to make money or, or because government wants to, to control a certain industry and so forth. Or give favors to some people and uh, hurt other people in the process of giving favors to others. Yeah. You've often applied this idea of individual liberty to the way commerce is done, to the, to the idea of a freer market rather than one controlled so much by government. That's correct. What are your thoughts about the free market? Well, I think the more the, uh, the customer controls in the, in the free market, the customer is king. And the customer ought to be king. A customer has to be king. In a, in a system that the individual is supreme, uh, you can't have any other system. Uh, and that's very frustrating for a lot of small businesses that, uh, oh my goodness, we've got some customers that are recalcitrant, non-re, and so forth. But that's, it. that's the only way that, that it can work because it, whatever you're doing has to be of service to people in one way or another, a, a positive service, or you ought to go out of business. There, there should be no other reason for you staying in business. So people really vote with their dollars when they yes, spend. that's and, exactly and so right. Businesses that work well and serve the public good uh, will succeed because people will buy their product, and businesses that don't serve the public will ultimately fail. It seems we've gone quite a distance from that in terms of, of the the factors that determine which businesses succeed and which fail today. Do you think government has been involved a little too much in that in that mix? Way too much. Mm. And you know, there's a there's a disconnect between ideology and actuality in the political system. Uh, several years ago, I went on a little campaign. And I talked to 15, I suppose, uh, elected officials. And I said to those elected officials, each one of them, do you think it's proper that government should hurt one group of people in order to benefit another group of people? And, and that's theory, okay? 
And in theory, the answer was always a very sincere, no, no, no. And then when I would point out, well, that's what you're doing, uh, <laughs> they would say, well, no, and they'd try to justify it. But, but the point is that there's some kind of a real chasm between activity and theory. In other words, theory and reality as to how we uh, really operate. Uh, and, well, and the theory mm -hmm. comes from the Declaration of Independence, that, and it's embedded in society. If you go to the average citizen, you ask them that same question, they say, that's absolutely wrong to, sure. to help some people, use the government to help some people and hurt other people. Well, when we come back from a, a break, Dick, we'll talk about how to bridge that gap between theory and real society. It's my privilege today to host Dick Rowland, founder and chairman of the board of the Grassroot Institute. We'll be right back to pick his brain a little bit more after this short message, so don't go away. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And I want to say thanks to producer Jay Fidel and to the wonderful team, the staff and volunteers of Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, together, we're all producing about 30 to 35 hours of original content from Honolulu that gets broadcast all across the world. So we can talk about issues that are of importance to Hawaii and important to the world. Our program, by the way, is called E Hana Kako, based upon a venerable Hawaiian saying, E Pule Kako, which means let's pray together. Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we also like to say let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. And that's why it's so appropriate today to be able to talk with Dick Rowland, the founder and chairman of the board of the Grassroot Institute, because he's been working at work, bringing people together to work together for a better economy, government, and society. And so, Dick, let me ask you this question. What prompted you, after uh, an illustrious career in the military, uh, retiring as a full colonel, then a, a splendid career as a multiple member of, a lifetime member of the Million Dollar Roundtable in insurance sales, you decided to launch a third career, <laughs> and that was to start in Hawaii, uh, a branch of, of a nationally networked uh, think tank uh, uh, program called the Grassroot Institute. What led you to do that? Ignorance. <laughs> 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 <No>. <laughs> I uh, actually, someone asked me if I knew what a think tank was. And I said, yes, I know what a think tank is. And they said, well, they had been talking to a national uh, columnist. Uh, uh, and, and that he had said, you guys ought to form a think tank out there. Uh -huh. And so, uh, so I said, yes, I'll take a, I'll take a, a, a stab at that. And, uh, and you so it was ignorance. <laughs> well, you know, um, at, before you get into the story and some of the personal motivation there, let me say something to our audience here, just by way of context. Uh, th there is a national network of think tanks with a, a designated think tank in each of the 50 states called the State Policy Network. These are each independent organizations that bring scholars and activists and public officials and citizens together, and they're responsible for doing two things as a think tank. One is research, to take issues that the, 
public policy is being made upon, legislatures are dealing with, and do all, all the research that, that is necessary to be done on those issues. And then the other thing they do is they educate the public. Now, there are big think tanks and small think tanks. There are the state policy network think tanks in each of the 50 states, but there are also national think tanks like the Cato Institute or the Heritage Foundation. And they tend to stand for a set of values to promote individual liberty, the free markets, limited accountable government. And Hawaii didn't have one such think tank 15 years ago, but Dick Rowland took it upon himself with a group of others to form one, and it, it has been designated the think tank of the state policy network. So Dick, tell us a little bit about that. What, what prompted the, the, the start of the Grassroot Institute as a think tank here in Hawaii? Well, you know, just what I said, the, the idea of, of trying to restore those values or to, where the values continue to exist to try to, to polish them and make them more prominent and make them more useful. And you're talking about constitutional values and values of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence. Remember, the Constitution is amendable. The Declaration of Independence is not amendable. So you mean it gets it gets it gets deep into society, like like the example right. that I gave. You talk to a legislator. In theory, they're saying this, but in actuality, they're doing the other thing. What we want to do is bring those all right, uh, bring those closer together. So how do we take life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness as ideals, and realize them in our society today? So that became the motivator. For yes. starting well, the Grassroot Institute. We're right back to we the people. Mm -hmm. We're right back to the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence says first, individuals form government, government doesn't form individuals. And that process was taken care of by the Declaration itself. They they proclaimed the individual supreme. The next thing they said that the we the people had a responsibility obligation to do was to elect representatives to to run the government mm. to operate the government and the idea there was that the average individual should be extraordinarily busy with a with a job with a family with a community uh, with all sorts of things uh, as he pursues happiness. So the idea to get somebody to run the government, but then somebody has to run, somebody has to watch these people that are running the government. And the declaration said, guess who has that obligation, authority, responsibility? We the people. So we the people haven't been doing a good job of that. And the idea for the Grassroot Institute is to take that third responsibility and make it easier not to do the responsibility for we the people, but to make it easier and get it organized so that, so that we the people are communicating with our elected representatives and saying, hey, let me give you an example. Right now, Rasmussen poll says that 80% of the U.S. public says that the U.S. government is too big. big. But that's not being communicated to our elected officials in a strong enough manner. And, you know, we really need a big billy club to go <laughs> and bang them on the head. But anyway, that's the reason for a certainly. Think tank. And you've that's certainly it. developed methods with a little more finesse than a billy club. <laughs> you know, oh, what you're describing here is the people, the grassroots really rising up and empowering themselves and educating. But you, you selected the name grassroot singular rather than grassroots. Uh, why is that? Well, because because the Declaration talks about the individual is supreme. And I thought, you know, we have to, because, you know, our society now is kind of a groupy society. <laughs> uh, you know, we got women that claim women's rights and children's rights, and we got uh, black people's rights and Hawaiian rights and all sorts of things. 
And when, when you could you could list every uh, single so, people group, uh, yeah, and, and talk about rights of each people group. Yeah, you could talk about it, but the fact is that we're all that that the Declaration says that we're all men are created equal. And By which you mean men and women, men of course. Men and women, of course. And and so and so the whole idea, the whole idea. I didn't. I, I thought grassroots sounds like sounds like a groupy thing. It's not the individual is supreme. The individual can get into a group, but you know these factions shouldn't have anything to do with it. It ought to be a group That's of people. Yeah. In, in other words, rather than advocate for any one group. And it, that doesn't deny the legitimacy of advocating for one group. Yeah. You saw the need for all people's rights to be advocated for, as all people created equal. And so this organization would be grassroots rather than made up of many different uh, rights groups and advocacy causes. But remember, I, because of all this prevailing anti uh, groupy thinking i wanted to remind our staff every day by our name that we cherish and honor the individual and the needs and wants of the individual well what and I also to help the individual to organize themselves into being we the people and to giving the proper guidance to our elected officials what i like about this is while it, we respect the diversity of all people. We also now have a movement that stands for all people together. That's correct. Working together, That's standing for our rights together as a people, uh, emphasizing the importance of being Hawaiian in the state of Hawaii, being American in the United States of America. That's right. And that, that's an important value, the grassroots singular, that there is something we have in, in, in common, and we stand for that which is in common to all people. You that's know, a brilliant idea. One of the interesting <clears throat> things about that is that, uh, that I didn't anticipate, I, I constantly get questions. Well, why is it grassroots instead of grassroots? And once I explain it, they never make the mistake again. Well, this, this is quite fascinating because I don't know if you and I had this conversation when you asked me to come on board to the Grassroot Institute and when the board appointed me uh, the pre president successor after you. But I, but I had this image of what was so important to the, the native peoples of Hawaii, and that is that the kalo, the taro, is the root. And from that single root, we have diversity, the, the, the leaves of the plant and so forth, but what unites us together is at the root. And, and I suggested to you, why not use that as, as a symbol? And so it was a wonderful opportunity yeah. to, to have this conversation. We were thinking along the same lines, that while there is this great diversity, while there are many blades of grass, as you, you would have it, or perhaps many different leaves that look differently from one another, there's something at which we must be united at the root. And, and that is really what Grassroot Institute stands for, which is the values of the Declaration of Independence. That's correct. Right. And that ensures unity in our nation, and it, it ensures equality to all people in, in our nation. What a great concept. I, uh, I just yesterday, uh, I got a questionnaire uh, from a U.S. government agency, and I decided to answer it. And, and you there did? Was, uh, yes. <laughs> and there was a point in there where they said, uh, what is your race? And I wrote in, I'm a member of the human race. <laughs> I love it. And <laughs> I don't like this question. Hmm. You know, I, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think, um, I think that our, uh, we want to honor each individual, each you know, the Declaration, sometimes people say to me, how, how do you know that they're honoring the individual? Well, you can read it and see it. But, but you know, in the language itself, can anyone, can any entity besides an individual pursue happiness? In other words, can your church pursue happiness? Uh, 
uh, groups don't pursue happiness. That's right. Organizations don't pursue happiness. Individuals. Individuals so you'd say, pursue happiness. So we got uh, permanent immutable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They're individual. Those are individual things. They aren't given to groups. A group can't even, uh, can't even handle them. That's right. So, so individual liberty is the, is the absolute bedrock for, for and, and it's the bedrock, as I mentioned, for the Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo religion. That's the bedrock that the whole thing stands on that. That's right. And, you know, oftentimes when you talk about liberty, you also talk about responsibility of the individual because liberty can't be fulfilled unless we actually carry out our responsibilities. What are some of those responsibilities that we have to each other if we want to preserve our liberties? Uh, let me deviate slightly yes, please, and just say please. that people are always talking about rights. Mm -hmm. Um, right, right, right. You'll find that just... But you see, it's impossible to have a right if you don't have a viable enforcement mechanism. So the first question, when somebody says, I, I, I have a, a, a right to an education, well, who in the hell is going gonna, is gonna to enforce that? And I just mentioned in the declaration, it says, we form the government, we elect the people, and then who in hell keeps, keeps an eye on these people? Well, the responsibility, the obligation belongs to we the people. And that's what the Grassroot Institute's trying to help to, to facilitate and to organize. Uh, so, so uh, it's, to me, that's all tied up with rights and the fact that we can't have a right. Uh, it's almost like somebody talks about a right, we should talk about the obligation and the responsibility for enforcing the right before we ever talk about right. the right itself. It, they're like mirror images of each yes. other. Every right has a responsibility. Every responsibility ha has a right. This is Kaylee Akina talking with Dick Rowland, founder and chairman of the Grassroot Institute. We're going to take a quick break and come back for our conclusion. And I want to talk with Dick about some of his uh, views on education and other areas that society is involved in. We'll be right back after this short break. Don't go away. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Welcome back to the final segment of today's Ehana Kako. Let's work together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My guest is founder and chairman of the board of the Grassroot Institute, Dick Rowland. We're having a fascinating discussion about values that are of ultimate importance to our state and our nation and the world and the values for which the Grassroot Institute was founded. Dick, you, you've cared, you care a great deal about education. In, in fact, you, you have a master's in education from Columbia University. Uh, you uh, have been very actively involved in the development of institutions related to education. But you see education as far more than training or more than passing on knowledge. What, what, what is your idea of the goal of education? What should that be in our society? What should education be bringing? Well, about? you know, the ideal education is, well, the whole purpose of education is to make, uh, is to develop our youth into being substantive, responsible, productive members of society. Mm. Um, and uh, so how do we do that best? Well, somehow, about the middle of 
of the 19th century, we got mixed up and, and, and we started saying we're going to do a favor uh, to families and we're going to educate their children. And, uh, and so now we got education that's separate from what I just said. In other words, now we got education that slowly but surely has separated itself and is talking about the, the accumulation of knowledge, which is important, and so forth. But we haven't, we haven't connected with values. And the reason we hadn't connected with values is that in a, in a government-run school, they've got to accommodate all sorts of values, and they finally give up and don't, don't do that. So, so you're ahead. talking about the fact that there was a time in our country, and indeed this was so when our country was founded, that families had the responsibility for providing for the education of their children. Families in which there was a context for character development, for uh, personal values. And yet we've seen in our country an evolution to the place where that education now is done by the government, uh, apart from the family. That's correct. And in the process, values are being lost because the family isn't instilling the values. And the family is a, a few people that are pursuing happiness and they're pursuing uh, their activities and they're different. Everyone is different. Uh, so, so, but the values, the basic values, generally, not always, but generally, are those values that are described in the Declaration of Independence. So, so what we've got is a divide that's, that's developed, and, and it's really getting serious, because, uh, you know, before the show, we were talking about, uh, I, I was asked to go to this government agency that was having a big meeting, and they were involved with uh, trying to, to solve the unemployment problem. Uh, or, you know, getting the unemployment to, into jobs. And so I was there as a small business representative. And so eventually the head of the department said, you know, well, we hadn't heard from Mr. Rowland and he's here to tell us about small business. And they had been talking interminably about education. They're gonna educate these people uh, that don't have a job to do flower arrangement. They're gonna educate them to uh, to fix cars and so forth. And it was seemed to be immaterial whether we were short of mechanics or whether we were short of flower sorters or uh, rangers. Uh, and so they said, what is your opinion? I said, I keep hearing about education, but, but way, for a typical small business owner, education is not as important as, as long as you get past reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, yeah. so basic reading, writing, arithmetic, the important thing is character. Because I, as a small business people, I, I care nothing about hiring an educated crook. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I'm not interested. So here's someone who could have the skill, the talent, the knowledge, but ultimately no character. No character. And, and, yes. and, and ultimately th that fails for business, it fails for society. Yeah, but what was really remarkable about this is these are a bunch of dedicated people. I mean, they're, you know, what, even if they don't think they've got an important job, they've convinced themselves that they do. And, and so, but they looked at me with total, uh, they, they were just so surprised by, and, and then they ask, how can you say education's not important? I said, I didn't say it was not important. I just said that character is more important because these people can actually do a little education. They can certainly do training on whatever this person's going to do. And this person has been trained in flower arrangement might end up at McDonald's. Mm. And that's not much help. Uh, for, you know, for McDonald's. So, so the key, and I think for our whole society, we need to get into character building, which comes from the family. And what helps the family in that character building is church, mm. mostly. And that's, that's what our society, that was the original development of the society. So we've got to go back and we've got to energize our churches uh, 
And we've got to take back from the government the responsibility so that, so that I, you and I, can take our kids, grandkids, whatever, and we can say, hey, uh, uh, they should, you know, I want them uh, to, or they want to study, whatever. Right. But the point is that that's an individual decision, and the government has no part in it, has, should have no part in it. You've been active in observing and participating in the political realm as well. And uh, frequently I, I hear a resistance from you to language like left or right or Democrat versus Republican, party partisans and, and so forth. Uh, what is the difficulty you have with this idea of framing things as being center left, center right? <laughs> oh, one part a party or or another you know i'm gonna uh, i'm going to quote um uh, ronald reagan quite by mistake i didn't come up with this because of ronald reagan or at least i don't think i did maybe i did but but if you read the declaration of independence uh a great deal of the declaration of independence is devoted to rejecting the idea of tyranny, and they call it tyranny. They say that the British government had committed tyranny on the colonies, and they gave instance after instance after instance. And so they said, we don't like tyranny. And the definition of tyranny is to have a government that gets bigger and more intrusive and starts pushing people down and down and down until they're just kind of enveloped in a, in a, a big morass of government. Uh, and the alternative is to let government, get government out of the way, do a very few functions very well under the leadership of we the people and leave we the people free to reach up and pull themselves up if they want and to make themselves better, more prosperous, more creative, more industrious, uh, and, and without government interference. So I, I don't think, and I hear that Ronald Reagan uh, mentioned very often, he doesn't care about left and right, he cares about up and down. Uh. I care <laughs> about up. I don't want any down. We've had down for 100 years or more, in the United States of America. It hadn't destroyed us yet, but if we keep on doing that, we will. So there again, that's one of the reasons for forming the Grassroot Institute is to stop that deterioration. Mm. And, and that's why you evaluate policies and laws and so forth on the basis of whether they move us upward in terms of freedom leave or us, downward. Leave us free to reach upward. If some individual doesn't want to reach upward, they don't reach upward. There's nobody going to make them, hey, you go reach upward. They're going to have to come up with that themselves. It's, they, if their pursuit of happiness is to be like Thoreau and, you know, live out on the lake, well, hey, if they can make it happen and don't hurt anybody else, uh, that's, you know, that's an individual choice. Dick, we've got about a minute and a half left, and I'm going to ask you a tough question at the very end. Well, you, you've invested your life in the pursuit of individual liberty and freedom. What would you like to be known for, or what would you like to be the, the legacy of your life in the years to come the, as, as your contribution to society? Tough question. Well, I'd just like to see... You know, speaking in very, very basic terms, I'd like to see a restoration of the American dream. Mm. And the American dream is that I am so happy to see the next generation richer, smarter, more free, more creative than my generation and than me. I want to see my kids be richer than me and, and happier than me and more, and more complete mm. than me. So if we could get that started in our society and I had something to do with it, I'd be tickled pink. 
Well, you certainly have a great deal to do with it now, and I want to thank you oh, for you founding bet. the Grassroot Institute. I want to thank you for continuing to be a driving force uh, in the organization and, and for your contribution that you're making and continuing in an upward way to make upward <laughs> in society. Thanks a lot for being on the program today. My guest today has been Dick Rowland. As we shared earlier, he is the founder and continues now as the chairman of, of the board of the Grassroot Institute. Dick is also an accomplished writer. Uh, he, you may see his work from time to time in an op-ed or an editorial in the newspaper, but if you'd be interested in some of the gems that he's written, go to the Grassroot Institute website, and when you get to the search function, just put in uh, Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, and our website is grassrootinstitute.org. That's singular, grassrootinstitute.org. Dot org, and you'll find many fine resources there for the pursuit of individual liberty, free markets, and limited accountable government. I want to say mahalo to the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. Until next week, e hanakako. Let's work together. Aloha.